Uh, our next reader is also from Chicago, Larry Sawyer. The first, uh, the first line of the bio he sent me threw me for a loop. Larry Sawyer thought the leaden winter would bring you down forever, but you <laughs> rode upon a steamer to the violence of the sun. Oh, yeah. I had to plug that into a search engine just to find out that it was Eric Clapton lyrics, Cream lyrics, yeah. right? <laughs> So let's read that again. Larry Sawyer thought the leaden winter would bring you down forever, but you rode upon a steamer to the violence of the sun. <laughs> when he's not engaging in the satiric japery, which I didn't look up, but I don't know what that means. Hopefully it's not too dirty. He edits milkmag.org, which is a great journal, curates the myopic books poetry series in Chicago, which is one of the coolest really reading series I know of in the country, definitely one of the coolest in the Midwest, very long running series, and is a member of the core faculty of the Chicago School of Poetics. His first full length collection is titled Unable to Fully California, and it's been published by Otis Press. One of my favorite things about Larry Sawyer's poetry is how missable it is. <laughs> Each poem creates such a weird, unfamiliar world that it makes your head spin a little, and at first it seems like nothing means anything. But sit quietly with a Larry Sawyer poem, and it eventually becomes clear that what at first might seem like surrealism just for effect is actually a very succinct, specific description of the world. Larry just describes it so uniquely that we don't even recognize it at first. When a poem is filled with lines like, two eagles descended, lapping the horse that won the race of existence. There's so much ambiguity, abstraction, and non sequitur that the words can sometimes just pass you by. But a few subsequent reads of that reveal multiple layers of meaning. There's the first confusing meaning where it appears the eagles and horse are in a race, <laughs> a race which the horse won, even though the eagles are lapping it. But if we read winning the race of existence as getting to the finish line of existence, let me just read this line again. Two eagles descended lapping the horse that won the race of existence. If we read winning the race of existence as getting to the finish line of existence, or in other words, dying, then we have a dead horse, and with the two eagles descending and lapping it, we have two birds of prey lapping up meat from a carcass. That line is no longer necessarily just experimental surrealist words slapped together at random, but instead a very unique though narrative description of a scene in nature. Larry's work proves to be like this consistently. On the surface, it's enjoyable for its mere weirdness, its surprising word combinations and whacked out music. But if a reader's willing to invest her attention into Larry Sawyer's work, she'll be rewarded with stunning descriptions and acute attention to language and even some very understatedly profound personal reflections so everyone, please welcome up Larry Sawyer. Thanks everyone for coming and thanks so much, Nick. That's uh, such a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm really humble. Um, I'm nearly as tall as you are. <laughs> I'm just, it's just a little bit. Needed. This is such a wonderful room. I mean, it actually smells new. I know that you won't get that on the video. But we have that. I just wanted to mention that. Smell vision. I think the, yeah, smell vision. I write almost a poem a day, or poem every other day. I mean, probably half of it is horrible, but um, it leaves me with a lot of poetry from which to um, sort of, I, I examine it repeatedly, obviously. And, sometimes publish some of them. Um, these are poems I've written in the past few months. Um, this first one's called Device from a Foreign Country. Beautiful strange allegiances, 
Your clumps of flowers that need watering slake the perils of contemplation. Truly menacing on autumn nights, she of temporal winters, today mouths yesterday's intimacies. Important frequencies, gilt humdrum seesaws, collide with the austerity of breath and the desire to cable her point blank. Perhaps we overvalue baffling underwater reefs, I mean. Flea circus cheeks, now hidden, we strobe. I sing of those too goony to know. Well, it would be silly to keep signing franchises. O oh, foxtrot uniform Charlie Kilo, meet me in the hula tent, strident and totaled. I rarely write anything about my hometown, which was sort of like Main Street USA, and it's, it's called Fairborn, Ohio. Um, but this sort of references, um, I guess, that time a little bit. It's called A Beautiful Blindness. We were served fresh hot slices of the red, white, and blue, then crawdads, potholes, and aria humming policemen. Spring was our masked phantom, leaping naked from a rope into the creek, and you said your shoulders were ripe, red as ambulances. The silt in our throats made dunes, mouths agape, gawking up at summertime jets. Hummingbirds left tiny autobiographies on windowsills. The rumor was we were hard of hearing. After school, we diligently practiced our disappearing. Bicyclists echoed off through autumn woods, brittle matches. Winters, we were on the brink. It was then, while mother was outside busy changing the sky, a soldier on Main Street was seen, plunging headfirst from the diving board of that movie house marquee into the fog. Sometimes to write my way out of a situation that I find myself in, I, I attempt to purposely write a really bad poem. This kind of resulted from one of those efforts. It's called Revision Rebellion. It's like an awkward read. Um, so if I say I meant to do that, I don't know. That doesn't really help, probably. It doesn't help the listener much. But I found enjoyment writing. Revision Rebellion. My pencil sighing and grievous, such insults you brooked. I now must cast you forevermore to the gloof of ignoble memory and so destroy my soul. Rising up in fabled Tuscany, O oh my trembling song, tell us of how the eraser wronged us. Reader, accept this elevated finger as I valiantly hold the door. Together we'll reach memory's floor. Quesas sera sera, my pencil, that beautiful bitch you serviced exceedingly well. But now she hooks to another's bagatelle. And left here without you, my heart doth swell. But without your oar, yonder shoreline is my destroyer. At your fate I sang your charms. How you, no dilettante, my alibi, set astride the urgent rewrites of the day. My co-defendant in life's court, we gather laurels while we may. Tarry not, winged er eraser, old time is still a stunt flying. This one's called uh, Vertigo Diary. Anyway, why monkeys? Which is a question anyone would ask. Smile no matter how much elation graces the outage. Fjords clacking. Get it? Aluminum orchestras plunge a romanticism. It was stopped up. Hecate's iffy gaze, unguent, tames history. None of these government elevators work. Tomorrow, colon, chemists wearing saucy watches receive scandalous attentions. I was sort of, um, I was sort of reading about creation myths from uh, various cultures all over the world. So I wrote this called uh, My Creation Myth. And I like Odin, so I'm sort of stealing Odin, putting him into my creation myth, which probably isn't 
legal or something, but <laughs> my creation that Odin cooks the western sun. He's not hungry. Odin casts February into the pond. Until now when a spring breeze slouches in. Loaded with hours. Not rudely at shadow. The coctagon in the corner. The cocked gun in the corner argues that modern men are greatly damaged. I was kind of wondering the other day what happened to Marilyn Manson. I'm sure he's still around, but it seemed like it was just in front of me all the time for a while there, and I just kind of, you know, I turned away from it. So I sort of turned back, and he seems to be gone. <laughs> but I don't know why when I titled this I was thinking of Marilyn Manson. Um, so it's called Spanking Marilyn Manson. <laughs> Hog Sniffer Combine seeks cloud-obsessed bazooka who would like to enjoy quiet evenings painting non-representational express commodes with plaid armatures whilst tweaking on Esperanto. L. Ron Bubber, Alabama style. Meanwhile, Gimp's food, fate, and life's death. Pimps to Slayer. Capiche? <laughs> it always fits, these barbarian chief PR guys, wrestling giraffes in Smallville between commercial breaks. Like, my point is, what is really known? Everything always hastens to the end. Congratulations on your god particles, Feedin. I mean, when we all look back into that wild someday, will the Fleetwood Mac have a lasting memorial? And I really don't like Fleetwood Mac, but they seem, <laughs> they seem as a group to have not really received the attention that they probably deserve, because I can tell that they put, they put a lot of effort into those songs, but it's just lost on me, so it's not a criticism necessarily. <laughs> This book was, uh, it took me, geez, like 10 years to end up writing all these poems. Um, but I'm very happy with it. Um, a lot didn't go into this, and it's probably best that no one ever sees the stuff that didn't make it into the book. But this one's called The Big Break. Oh, and this is Unable to Fully California. Uh, the Big Break. The light will never be perfect, but you filmed in the palazzo anyway, and the grip swarmed about us like, well, flies. And I couldn't remember why you requested me to enunciate my lines like Deadwood. But then I remembered you said, I get more Keanu and less Depp. So then I said something much more Keanu-esque in reply, I thought, and less Deppic to test you. But what came out was misconstrued as mere Eastwood. Then an eruption within me produced a glimmer of some terrific Bacon-esque charm, slathered with a subtle varnish of Hasselhoffish implacability. But you then requested a dash of pittish vulnerability with my clintonic stoicism. So I stuttered slightly to levy a hint of hallucinatory Dick Van Patten Saturday family outing leadership to my bradish, nearly waifish DiCaprios. And you shouted, Too fucking Baldwin, goddammit! <laughs> and I seamlessly launched into the debauchery of my precision Billy Bob, pausing periodically to season it with a bellicose Shatner-esque bastardism. And you fumed, Bowie, not Schwimmer, asshole! <laughs> and at this point, my sheep potpourri of fer feralisms, interspersed with nearly schizoid Denzels and nostalgic D Douglas Fairbanks Juniors, brought the entire crew to tears as the light was finally perfect, crossing my face on my best side, producing a halo effect of spellbound yet majestically skittish Nicholson's, as I just so happened to notice out of the acrimonious corner of my James Earl Jones left eyelid that you were not at that precise moment paying any particular attention to anything but your own slightly Kubrick fingernail. That's a difficult read. <laughs> I occasionally um, take words from the dictionary and just apply new definitions to them, just for fun. So this is called New Vocabulary. And I know what most of these words, um, I know the, the actual definitions of most of these words. I 
I think maybe one, I actually don't even know what it means, but um, I enjoyed writing these new definitions for these words. Fenestrations, the events immediately preceding the removal of a brazier. Antediluvian, the Venusian sky during summer solstice as seen from the bottom of a pool. Liquefaction is a group of prom goers on a half naked bender. Gesticulator is a policeman talking in loud tones through a plate glass window. Machinations is the island exuberance of middle aged divorcees. An obelisk is a meteor shower that results in a forest fire. <laughs> and Sibylline is the dumb but beautiful redneck sister of your fiance. <laughs> This one's called So Toyota. <coughs> Jen was so Toyota as I stood there on the balcony. She handed me another beer and I was definitely Mercedes. I'm going back in a week, she said, and gave me that Jaguar look. That's terrific, I managed, but flashed a Ford Escort. <laughs> Walking home under a Mitsubishi moon, I reflected on how Honda our lives had become. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> Some of these are painful memories buried in silliness. Um, let's see, dead air, dead air. To mainstream poetry. I don't know if anyone calls anything mainstream anymore, but to mainstream poetry. We are entering the underworld, I mean Martha's Vineyard, and Orpheus can't find an ATM. You see, I was reading Franz Wright and thought myself up to the challenge. Little did I know that my soul is made of daffodils. Someone really should have told me. I wrote this for Lena Vikowskis and she's sitting in the audience. Inside the waves. She was the last can of soup, her steaming metal poured along the late afternoon streets, into the dirty gutters, across the boulevards, the avenues, the promenades. And down at the track they placed bets on her brood, as in her veins the tomato soup hot as blood poured. She ate the soup as if it were the food of the gods. She crossed the street dragging down the sun. Pizza parlors closed one after another in her wake. She called from a great distance inside the waves, her hair holding seahorses and starfish, her arms green with the brine of millennia, as if the evening could ever understand the formula of DNA that dripped from her eyes. She knew that no one would understand that the food of her flesh was something that no man could ever do without, in silences that boil over like hurricanes. No one survived her misunderstood sentences None could take their eyes off her, steam rising from every manhole in the city that children rebuild every night in her sands. I might read a couple more. I have no idea how long I've been reading. It's been hours. Has it? <laughs> it feels like it. Wow. Um, I, I sometimes steal... Uh, the end words from an, another poem and write a new poem and just use those end words. It's just sort of like a way to get started. This, uh, these end words came from a Ray De Palma poem and I can't recall the name of it, but um, this is another poem where as a kid I read um, Archie's Comic Digest a lot. And um, I, th I think I was reading a Ron Paget poem where he had written about, um, I don't know if it was Goofy or something, the comic book. Um, character. So I inserted a couple into this poem. V Velocissimo, which is like a orchestral like stage direction meaning like play faster. Velocissimo. So this is happening in fast motion like this. Reggie and Veronica will always be together on that blueberry, blueberry hill of history, but what was gained by Jughead's expiation? No matter what he does, he fails head first. And Archie's head is as red as a fireplace, and after seeing Veronica's new skirt, he's in a haze. 
Mr. Lodge is always the bearer of bad tidings, and Midge told Moose about Reggie's advances. Coach Cleats wants Archie at practice, but circumstances dictate that he has to run from Betty in hot pursuit. Archie's sweater, thank God, is intact, and city girls await him at college. But for now, no words can describe Jughead's mystifying grammar. And what of Moose, all-powerful and menacing? <laughs> I might read two more, <laughs> that's okay. Um, Miracle of Apples. Someday the apples will be liberated, the pear will start a revolution, and the banana will commit suicide rather than be executed. In tense meetings, the cantaloupe has come up with a new political system. It exists at the center of an ovoid universe on a long summer afternoon. You dream of secret conversations that drip with sticky pink juice. Yesterday, the pomegranate gave a speech and received a rousing ovation. But at midnight, patrols of vegetables rode through town, plastering posters of the banana on every available wall. Grapes everywhere were deceived into joining the knives, forks, dishes, mugs, and even a glass of wine. Now dinner has descended upon me. They will lead me to my ordinary death, as real as the breath of a cannibal. might close with the um, title poem from the book here. I got so many comments about this title, which was just kind of like a throwaway thing. When I wrote it, I was kind of like, okay. But so many people had to sort of tell me, like, it's like a split, a split infinitive, and like went into this big discussion about it, and I said, yes, I know that, but, but I'm, still allowed, I'm still allowed to do whatever I want. <laughs> It's called creative writing. <laughs> Unable to fully California. I stare up at the sky and notice Orion, the Big Dipper, the North Star, and see Venus on the horizon. On my sleepwalk, this dark purple lacquer, a sudden comforter, this night, French kisses me, while the trees just stand there serenading. We really can't trust this nocturnal sightseeing, but the climb does sweeten as the air thins ever higher towards some point we try to make. Words bake in that hot moonlight. Beastly pine cones have a conversation with me. Save us from this poem. We need to tell you something. We've been watching you try to write your way out of it, and we're tired. That's in quotes. I'm tired too, but I look out at the edge of this paper and see some mastodons there, I say. <laughs> the next morning, I can't remember a thing. Over here, something about a bad dream. Life goes on. We live a life of itineraries. I'm glad, however, that together we can open a colorful brochure for some new world called hope. Thanks.